remember the text that we have been using quite often and frequently in 2 Timothy 2.15 where the Apostle Paul exhorts young Timothy to study to show himself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth and I think you are beginning to learn through these messages perhaps you have not been able to lay hold of the all of the things which we have said and perhaps you do not believe all of the things that we have said perhaps you have rejected a portion of them but I am sure that all of you have at least conceded this one point and that is that the word of truth does demand a right dividing I think this is clear to all of us no matter how much you may agree or disagree on the things which we have given you that the word of truth does require a proper division in order to understand it and that this uh, is the result of study uh, the word study doesn't only mean to open a book and turn on a lamp and meditate it means to make every effort to put everything aside and make this the goal of our Bible reading that we rightly divide it that everything in our understanding of the word must be geared to this one great goal enabling ourselves to rightly divide that which God has given in his word and we will not demonstrate much more the great truth that the word of God falls into proper divisions and unless it is properly divided we're going to end up in a jungle of confusion and we're going to show you another division this morning and uh, at last we hope we have arrived at the place where the doctrinal foundation we have been laying will suddenly become very important to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, at verse 32, I would like to show you a very clear distinction and division that is made in the Word of God. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, speaking, says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. I think you will readily recognize that there are three divisions here made of the human race. There is also another division made, which is larger and more broad than this, saved and unsaved. God, first of all, divides the race in two, those who are saved and those who are unsaved. Those who are saved are called the church of God, and those who are unsaved are called Jews and Gentiles. But I think if you've read the Pauline epistles, you will agree that Jews and Gentiles upon salvation become neither Jews nor Gentiles, nor Christian Jews nor Christian Gentiles, but they become one in the body of Christ and lose their racial distinction. So technically then we have three divisions in the human race, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Church of God, who are neither. Now with that established in your minds, let me give for your consideration the great fact but in the Word of God we find three distinct ages or dispensations dealing with these three distinct and separate groups of people. And also we have three divine systems of government dealing with these three distinct and separate groups of people in their three distinct and separate ages or dispensations. And it is this division that we are most in, uh, involved in at this time and most interested in. Let me demonstrate further. The division of the human race known as the Jews had a very definite and specific dispensation of time allotted to them. It ran actually from Sinai or from the calling of Abraham, we'll go back that far, to the cross of Calvary. God, in order to govern this chosen race of people called the Jews, instituted a divine system of government. This divine system was known as the Law of Moses. It was never imposed upon Gentiles excepting those who willfully and gladly became Jews or proselytes. The Gentiles were never bound by this divine system of government. The Law of Moses was never taught to the Gentiles. The heathen nations were never brought under its legality. It belonged solely and wholly 
to the Jewish people. This age or dispensation came to an end at the cross of Calvary. Actually, experimentally, it did not come to pass until it was revealed through the Apostle Paul that a new dispensation had replaced it. Now the Gentiles. The Gentiles were first set aside or given up by God in ages past. I think personally it has to do historically with the Tower of Babel, and at least in that area of history, when God gave the Gentile nations up and called a chosen nation, called Israel. But he will return to the Gentiles and bless them again. He promised it through his prophets. But the blessing of the Gentiles and God's dealing with the Gentiles depends upon Israel being restored to the favor of God. Therefore, the Gentile blessing and God's dealing with the Gentile cannot come and will not come until Israel is saved nationally, until they recognize their sin and rejection of Messiah, until they repent of the crucifixion of Jehovah and turn in one day to him. This will happen at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. And it will usher in the long prophesied kingdom. When the kingdom comes on earth, when it comes and God's will is done on earth as it's done in heaven, the Gentiles will be blessed. And the Gentiles will be governed by the king who reigns over the kingdom of heaven. And God has given a divine system of government under which the Gentiles shall one day live. This is called, and I'll call it this, kingdom teaching, or kingdom law, or kingdom government. And this will be applied and instituted and carried out by the king himself when he comes to reign over the Gentiles as he sits on David's throne with Israel as the head of the nation. However, there is a third group of people, Christians, believers, saints, sons of God, who are in the church. They are neither Jews or Gentiles. They are not under the law of Sinai, and neither are they under the kingdom law. They are governed by an entirely different set of regulations and rules. They are under an entirely different teaching. They are governed by an entirely different government, and it is called grace, G-R-A-C-E. Now, back under the law, the Jews didn't have too much trouble intermingling teaching. There was only one kind of teaching. It was just simply the law. The only problem they had was understanding it. And so they had so many scribes and so many teachers who spent their time studying the scriptures and teaching the law. There was no such thing under Sinai's government of intermingling law and grace. And under the Gentiles' blessing time, when they shall be governed by kingdom teaching, there will be no intermingling either. But in the age of grace, there is a tremendous amount of intermingling of grace and law and kingdom teaching. And as a result, the Galatian letter was written because an entire assembly of believers had, brought in, had been brought into bondage by such intermingling, by such frustrating of the grace of God. The clear liberty that belonged to believers was being taken from them and made negative by the positive teaching of the law. The wonderful and glorious liberty and release from the yoke of bondage that had come to the Galatian believers by the release of Calvary. They were being robbed of it by false teaching, teaching that intermingled 
two divine systems of government, a teaching that didn't rightly divide the word of truth, a teaching that couldn't separate the difference between what belongs to believers and what belongs to the Jews and what belongs to the Gentiles. So, I find that the Galatian condition has prevailed down through the 19 centuries of church history until today. Now, let us get to our subject. Believers generally today who study the scriptures, any at all, who earnestly search the scriptures, any at all, to see if these things be so, are not too much bothered by intermingling of Sinai's law with the teachings of grace. Now, there are several reasons for this. I'm not talking about professing Christianity, which would include all of the law keepers and so forth. I'm talking about those who are truly born again. They're not bothered too much with Moses' legality. One of the reasons for this is simple. The difference between law and grace is too obvious to us. The clear-cut division between Sinai and Calvary is too easily seen even by casual Bible readers. For instance, when we read the book of Genesis chapter 17 and we read that God commanded the, first bo- or the, uh, the, the males of every family to be circumcised, and then we read in the book of Galatians that circumcision is absolutely forbidden and that it means absolutely nothing to the believers in the age of grace. This is clearly seen. The division is so marked that no believer could fall into the heresy of demanding circumcision in this age of grace. For instance, the subject of the Sabbath I don't think is a troublesome subject to real believers who study the Scripture. I wouldn't be afraid to go out and gather up sticks on the the Sabbath, which is really Saturday, would you? I wouldn't be afraid that God would have me stoned to death for gathering firewood on Saturday. I'm not bothered too much by that kind of legality. There are many other things that could be said in this regard. For instance, the offerings. True Bible believers don't generally fall back to offering the Mosaic offerings, the Levitical sacrifices. They don't insist upon going to an altar with a real lamb and slaying that lamb or offering the peace offerings and the bird offerings to God. They no longer believe in the priesthood of Aaron. They don't depend upon the scribes and the Pharisees to interpret God's will for them. This kind of legality, I don't think, really bothers true believers too much. Another reason is there has been much teaching on the subject. And you'll notice that Bible teachers especially, one of their long suits is drawing distinctions between law and grace. And they like to show all that was involved in the system which belonged to Moses and contrast it with the law uh, law of grace, for truly it is a law, a royal law, and showing that there is so much of a contrast there that none of us should be troubled with mosaic legality. And this leads us to a very, very, very unhappy condition. Because most believers today are quick to tell you, and whether they would tell you or not, they at least think so, that they are free then from most taint of legality. And one of their favorite sayings is what Paul said, you know, we're not under law, we're under grace. And yet some of those who loudly decry that we are not under law but under grace, their lives are the most legalistic. And it proves a very definite point. Believers today are suffering from legality. A terrible kind of legality. A worse kind of legality than Moses' legality. This is the legality that I shall call, in these few messages that we'll bring on the subject, kingdom legality. Kingdom legality. If you were to ask me before we began our studies of the book of Galatians, how much legality is in your life? How much rules and regulations govern you instead of grace and the personal presence and ministry of the Holy Spirit? I would have probably been modest enough (laughs) to say, 
A small amount of legality undoubtedly is in my life. But, you remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And you remember what they said in return? They said, we're not in bondage to any man. Never were. Don't accuse us of being bound up with any bonds or anything. Why, we're free people. And they were the worst slaves of all, were they not? And the point is that they were in the worst kind of bondage and didn't even know it. And thought that this was the way they were supposed to live in that kind of bondage. Their bondage was to sin. Ours is to a kingdom legality. And I think that it could probably be said generally that there is perhaps not a single believer in the body of Christ who has escaped it. There's a reason for this, too. One is, there's very, very little teaching on the subject. All the clear distinctions are drawn between the law and grace, aren't they? How much teaching have you ever heard drawing the distinction between the kingdom teaching and grace? Ah, very little. In fact, it is a result of not rightly dividing the dispensations. If Paul had the dispensation of grace committed to him, then the kingdom area and age and dispensation cannot be binding upon those in the age of grace. And because of a failure to see this point, the point that we've been laboring now for several weeks, kingdom teaching is generally in the Christian world today all lumped in with the teachings of grace. And we start at the book of Matthew and we teach right on through the New Testament and say that Everything in the New Testament is binding upon those who are in the age of grace. The only real division that's made in the Christian world this morning is the difference between the Old and New Testament. And it's such a, it's such a weird division that, generally speaking, the Christian world says anything in the Old Testament has nothing to do with Christians. And anything in the New Testament has nothing to do with the people in the Old Testament. That's the only great division that's really made in the Christian world. Agreed? So they say it's the Old and New Testament. Anything in the Old Bible, they say, doesn't have anything to do with us. It's in the New Bible that we're to read and pay attention. And everything from Matthew to the closing chapter of Revelation is binding upon the believer today. And there isn't anything further from the truth because they fail to recognize the third division in the Word. And that is that there is very definitely a divine system of government given that is neither Jewish nor of Moses, nor is it Christian, and of grace, it is kingdom. And I think when we begin to examine it a little bit, you're going to wish and hope and pray that God delivers you from its legality, for it is far worse than the system under which the people of Israel lived when Moses, his commandments were binding upon them. And, of course, not only a lack of teaching... It's caused also from the fact that it's very difficult to rightly divide some of these teachings. And therefore, most Bible teachers do not try it. I picked up a commentary yesterday on the book of Matthew, and it's about this thick. And it's by a man who has two or three great uh, degrees in the theological world. He is noted the world over as an excellent Bible student and an expounder of the Scriptures. He's a favorite of Bible conferences. Bible schools and seminaries and Christian groups all over the world. And as I leafed through his commentary on the book of Matthew, I was absolutely amazed and astounded. I was amazed and astounded that everything in the gospel of Matthew was applied to the believer. And when he came to a verse that just simply wouldn't fit under the teachings of grace, he just omitted it and went on to the next verse. It was absolutely fantastic the things that this man taught under the guise of the doctrines of grace. Fantastic. So much so that I decided that the book ought to be destroyed. I was going to give it away. But I decided that the book ought to be destroyed when I discovered the insidious contents of that book. And it spurred me on to make this division in your lives and hearts too from the Word of God. It is not only due to false teaching, it's due to the fact that we've been taught over a period of years like this. 
Think, for instance, of how early in life we were taught to recite the Lord's Prayer, which has nothing whatever to do with the age of grace, but belongs to the kingdom itself. And in the very passage where the Lord's Prayer is taught, the Lord Jesus plainly states that vain repetition in prayer is an abomination to God, yet the Lord's Prayer has been vainly repeated for years and years and years. Out of the same passage that forbids vain repetition in prayer. And for years we've been taught to pray for our daily bread and to pray that we might forgive our, uh, those who trespass against us their trespasses. Why? In order that we might be forgiven. We've prayed for years for the kingdom to come. Yet this prayer has nothing whatever to do with the believers in the age of grace. But we were taught it. My memory work when I was a little boy in Sunday school consisted of kingdom teaching. It was the Lord's Prayer, it was the Beatitudes, it was the Ten Commandments. These were the things we committed to memory. These were the things that were impressed upon us as our rule of life. These were the things that was drilled into us as being the divine government under which we were to live. So it isn't easy, brother, to get out of legality. It's been put in us from too many years past. What kind of result does it have in the believer's life? Well, I can only testify from the result it has had in my life. I have failed to make this division. I have failed to make it in my preaching, as you will see. I have failed to make it in my teaching over the years. I have failed to make it in my own life. Many times I have seized upon kingdom principles and tried to apply them in my life. Honestly, earnestly, I have begged God's help in making these principles to work. I have done whatever adjusting I thought necessary in my life to bring them to pass. And then oftentimes in private, afraid to confess publicly that it didn't work, I have wept before the Lord and wondered why this thing was frustrated in my life, why it didn't work, when here it was so clearly laid down in the scriptures and so clearly taught that this was something the Lord wanted in my life and of me. Kingdom legality is far worse than legality that is spawned of Moses. This legality is far more reaching. It infiltrates our lives until we lose and sacrifice and give up the liberty which we have in Christ. And I think many believers who loudly say, we're not under the law, we're under grace, you know, and yet they strive daily to live under kingdom principles and hence live mostly without joy, without peace, and without a real sense of liberty in Jesus Christ. Liberty, brother, means that our actions are unhindered. Liberty means that we are not under stringent boundaries. We are not under the burden of rules and regulations. It is not principles with which we deal. In the liberty which we have in grace, it is a blessed person with whom we deal. And how I pray to God that the legality that is in my life might have the light of the word of God brought to bear on it. And I haven't done this in private before I came down here because that would have given me a superior feeling. And I would have been preaching up here saying, now I've already applied these things in my life, now you people get with it. I haven't done that. I have deliberately left these things in my own personal life until I came to them in the messages for the assembly. Because I want the Holy Spirit to apply this truth to me this morning as he applies it to you. I want him to convict me as he convicts you. I want him to open my eyes to the legality in my life as he opens your eyes to the legality in your life. I want to be busy in these messages searching my heart, not yours. I've deliberately left them for my own personal adjustment until this time when we could do it together. Now there are some things concerning kingdom teaching that I want to give to you. And then we are going to draw some examples this morning from the word of God as to the difference between the kingdom teaching and grace. And then tonight we will take up this vast subject from the 12th chapter of Luke, take no thought for tomorrow. First of all, this must be said of kingdom teaching. It is absolutely different and distinctive in its nature 
from the teaching of Moses' law. If you look to the Gospel of Luke chapter 16, verse 16, Read carefully just to establish this point. The law and the prophets were until what? Or who? John. John the Baptist. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. The preaching, therefore, of the kingdom of God, the divine government of the kingdom of God, is entirely different than the teachings of Moses. The teachings of Moses, the law and the prophets, prevailed down until John's time. They were in force. But Jesus says that that teaching and that divine government has been replaced by another, the teachings of the kingdom of God. John first began to teach them. And it was soon seen that it all was of works. For in the third chapter of Luke, when the publicans and the soldiers and the people in general came out to be baptized of John, they asked the same question, what shall we do? For they recognized that to enter the kingdom, they must take upon themselves the kingdom teaching and the kingdom government, and they knew it was different than the teachings of Moses, and they wanted to know what way is it different. And John, in the third chapter of Luke, and we'll not go to the passage, but you mark it down, expounded to these three groups of people, the soldiers, the publicans, and the people, what they must individually do to come under kingdom teaching and under kingdom government. Now the second point that makes kingdom teaching different than the teaching of the law or the teachings of grace, and this is the vital point, and hear it clearly, kingdom principles and kingdom teachings Kingdom laws, kingdom rules and regulations as Jesus taught them in the Sermon on the Mount and so forth, anticipated something which does not exist today. They anticipated the personal presence and the personal reign of the king himself. Did they not? You didn't think that this kingdom was going to be run without a king, did you? The kingdom teachings and the kingdom government anticipated the crowning and the reigning of the king himself. For this king was to bring in the kingdom. And when he brought in the kingdom by personally being seated upon David's throne, he would not only institute and administer kingdom teachings and laws, but he would also bring to pass kingdom conditions. Hear me now. What are the kingdom conditions? The kingdom conditions which will prevail during the king's reign involve three things. The will... The flesh, and guess who? The devil. When Jesus brings in the kingdom and institutes kingdom teaching, he will also bring three tremendous changes in the world, the flesh, and the devil. The first thing he will bring is in the 35th chapter of Isaiah. Read the whole chapter when you go home. It's only ten verses. This change is brought to pass in the world. The desert shall blossom forth as a what? A rose. A highway of holiness. The hills running down with milk and honey and new wine. Isaiah tells over and over in his prophecy of the time when the king reigns. He will unlock the earth, unlock the animal kingdom, unlock the world from the curse which has been upon it through the fall of Adam. The world itself, the soil, the things that grow, the animal kingdom, it will be transformed. The lion will lay down with the lamb. A child can play on a cockatrice den. No one will hurt nor harm in all the holy mountain or kingdom of the Lord. A man who's a hundred years old will be considered a child. So Isaiah prophesied. 
Now consider this first phenomenal change that was to come in with the kingdom. Secondly, the devil, praises be to God, will be put out of operation during the entire reign of the kingdom. In the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, you may read that when the king comes and takes the reins of government, he will cause an angel to come down out of heaven with a chain. And the devil is to be bound with a chain and cast in the bottomless pit, and there he stays for the entire length of the kingdom. And what about the flesh? I'm not thinking now about my flesh as much as I'm thinking about flesh in general. The natural impulses of men's flesh will be controlled. Not inwardly as they are controlled now in the life of the believer, outwardly by a king who shall reign in absolute pure righteousness. And with a rod of iron he will put down every insurrection and every disobedience. If you'll go back and read the Gospels, my friend, in this light, you will be amazed at how much intermingled in the kingdom teachings are the fierce threats of being cast into hell by the righteous king. All of it in the Sermon on the Mount, too, my dear friends. Now think of all men's flesh being outwardly controlled by a king who reigns in pure righteousness with a rod of iron, who will know everything that goes on in his kingdom, and who will immediately put to death, so Isaiah says in his prophecy, chapter 60, every person who disobeys him or rebels against him. And consider that the animal kingdom will have the curse removed, and the earth will have the curse removed. The devil will be bound and put in the bottomless pit. Now, my dear friends, you bind up the devil and put him in a pit and control the flesh of every man who walks on the face of the earth and take the curse off of this earth, and I can live under kingdom conditions, and I can live under kingdom teachings. But you consider the fact that the devil is not bound this morning. He is a roaring lion, walking up and down the earth, seeking whom he may devour. He is our adversary, accusing us in heaven. And consider that the earth itself has locked up its goodness against us. We can't even grow a garden, bless your heart, without the weeds choking it out. And if my garden would grow automatically and produce the tremendous harvest that it will someday in the age of the kingdom, I could sit in my rocking chair on my front porch the rest of my life and take no thought for what I should eat tomorrow. Couldn't you? Bless your hearts, you can. You bind the devil for me, and you take the curse off of my garden, and take the curse off the animal kingdom, too, so that the foxes don't kill all the rabbits on the place, and a few other odds and ends. And you control the flesh of all my neighbors, and everybody in this present uh, world we can go back to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we can start applying some of these principles and find out their work instead of ending up in frustration in our lives. As far as I'm concerned, if you don't get any other point but this one, you've got a major point right here. Now, I'd like for you to go with me to the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And I'm going to show you the difference between kingdom teaching and the teachings of grace. I'm going to spend the rest of this message in the Sermon on the Mount. First of all, I want to establish, I can't uh, take the entire Sermon on the Mount. I first thought for this series of messages that we would expound the Sermon on the Mount verse by verse, uh, three chapters. But I've, I've uh, felt inclined to, to choose against that. But I would like to consider a portion of the fifth chapter this morning only to do one thing, and that is to demonstrate the impossibilities, the impossibility of applying these principles to your life in the age of grace. I want to show you, brethren, that the kingdom teachings are not pure Mosaic law. Neither are they the teachings of grace. They are an enlargement of Moses' law, far more stringent than Moses' law, far more impossible than Moses' law. You say, can that be? Indeed it can be. Because it anticipates, as I told you, the binding of Satan, the release of the earth, 
and the control of all human flesh by the righteous king. Now, in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the king teaching. He is not teaching here as head of the body. That's the reason why these things have nothing to do with the body of Christ. He is not teaching here as the ascended and exalted Lord over his church. He is not teaching here as the Savior, the Lamb of God who gave his life for the sins of the world. He is teaching as Israel's king, and he is laying down the kingdom principles and the laws that shall govern his kingdom. And if you'll notice, first of all, I think we're going to start in verse, uh, well, we'll start in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, and if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, and neither do men light a candle, but put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy. What did this righteous king come to do? Brother, he came to see that every jot and tittle of it was carried out and some other things on top of it. But to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore, listen, shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. First of all, let me tell you that the king says that when the kingdom is established, the law, he is going to see to it, that every jot and tittle of the law is fulfilled. And furthermore, he says that if anybody in my kingdom breaks the least of the commandments of the law and shall teach others to do that, he'll be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And furthermore, he said, the scribes and Pharisees, who were men who kept Moses' law, he said, if your righteousness doesn't exceed theirs, you won't even get into the kingdom. Law-keeping won't even be enough to get into the kingdom. It must go past the keeping of the law to the keeping of kingdom laws and principles. For instance, consider the ridiculous fact that for years we have been told that it is Christian believers in the age of grace who are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We are not the light of the world and neither are we the salt of the earth. Because there is coupled with the statement that ye are the salt of the earth, the warning from the king. That if you're not as salty as you ought to be, you'll be cast out and trodden down and destroyed. You want that in the age of grace? Do you? You'll have to sacrifice that glorious liberty we know as the security of the believer if you do. It wasn't the boast that they were the salt of the earth. It was the warning that they better be. And do you know what the purpose of saying they were the light of the world was? The purpose was to tell them this great truth, that if they would show any light to the world at all, it would have to be through their own good works. That the kingdom was to be established on works, and those who would lighten the Gentiles, and this is Old Testament talk, read the prophets, and see how Israel, when the kingdom was set up, was to be a light to the Gentiles. Remember? How were they to lighten the Gentiles? By their own good works. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul teaching any place in his epistles that our good works is the only light the world has? I want to tell you, brother, your neighbors living in awful darkness. Your neighbors are living in awful darkness. If the only light they have are your good works. Your good works are filthy rags. They are nothing. It better be that in the age of grace that what glorifies God is the seeing of Christ's righteousness in us, not our good works. Our good works, we have none. It is his works 
that glorify the Father. His righteousness, that is the only light the world has, for in the Gospel of John, which deals with grace and truth, we hear him say, I am the light of the world. And he that walketh after me, or followeth after me, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John said of him, He was that true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And oh, let me tell you, I've heard believers stand up in prayer meeting and say, Remember, ye are the light of the world. Let your neighbors see your good works that they may glorify your Father. Jesus said, Listen. In the kingdom every law shall be carried out. Every jot and every tittle that Moses has written in the prophets of given shall be carried out. And above it there will be a righteousness that exceeds even the scribes and the Pharisees. For, listen to what he says in verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. He's referring to the law and contrasting the teachings of the kingdom. Listen. Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I, and who is I? The king. I, the king, say unto you, this is what's going to be in my kingdom. Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, which is stupid, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. It's pretty hard to fit that in the age of grace, isn't it? This won't go. It won't go because this is kingdom teaching. And it has to do with the relationship of a man with his brother when the earth has been unleashed from its bondage, when the Satan has been chained in the bottomless pit and can no longer be blamed for our relationship with others, when the flesh of all men is controlled by the righteous king, when the king lays down his principles and his rules, then... You be angry with your brother without a cause and you'll be in danger of the judgment. Call him stupid or call him a fool and you'll end up in hell. That's what you'll do. For every reason in the kingdom shall be taken from you for this kind of action. And it will be clearly seen that those who are angry without a cause with their brother do so because of the willful sin of the heart and not because of the environment and the prevailing conditions. No, it won't fit. And notice that there is much teaching here on the relationship of a brother with other brothers. Notice, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, and first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. And I can't tell you the time that I've had believers use this passage on me. And say this is what regulates believers in the age of grace. First of all, I ask you in the light of Hebrews 13, 20 or 10, where is the altar? What order do you go to, my brother, with your gift? Read the New Testament, but read all of it. And read in the epistles which belong to the believers under grace the great truth that we don't have an altar now except the altar that's in heaven. And that we do offer gifts and sacrifices but they are of a spiritual nature now as a holy priesthood. You say, well, I'm spiritualizing. Okay, spiritualize it then. But there's not a man among us who ever lived by this principle excepting when it was convenient to do so. Let me tell you something. If every time I went to pray, which is giving a spiritual sacrifice to God, if every time I went to pray, and every time I wanted to give a love gift for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and every time I wanted to offer the sacrifice of praise, if I couldn't do it until I had searched out every man in the world who held something in his heart against me and made it right with him, I'd never make a sacrifice as long as I live. This has to do, my friends, with those who have something in their hearts against you, not something in your hearts against them. It is not possible for me to be reconciled.
to all those who hold something in their hearts against me. Therefore, if this belongs to me, my dear friends, it is impossible for me to offer any gifts unto God. For all at liberty we have in grace. Brother, hold your grip against me all you want to. You can't keep me from the throne of grace. Hold your grudge against me in your heart. My sacrifices are still laid on heaven's altar and accepted. Do you thank God for that? That's liberty. This passage has bothered me. There been times when I've gone to prayer and I've thought about the brothers who held grudges in their hearts against me. And I thought, well, maybe I ought to go out and talk to them and see if I could get reconciled to them. You're wasting your time. We have to do with him who is at an altar that cannot be touched with hands. And we have to do with him who has bid us come, whether our brothers want to be reconciled to us or not. For thank God we have been reconciled to him who seated at that altar. This is what matters. All he's saying, I don't overlook the, the fact that there's another passage which deals with the troubles in your heart. Yes, indeed, we're going to deal with that. It's over in the 18th chapter of Matthew. Taken right out of kingdom teaching and applied in the age of grace by every law keeper that comes along. I want to show it to you in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and it begins at verse 15, and it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, and that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. And verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Why is there so much teaching in the kingdom teaching concerning a brother's relationship with other brothers? In verse 34 and 5, which concludes this passage, you will find out right fast. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Do you read that? Why is it necessary in the kingdom for me to go to a brother who holds something in his heart against me and get reconciled with him? Because he is a stumbling block to me. He's endangering me of not forgiving him for holding this grudge against me. And if this brother has trespassed against me, I need to go to him and show him that I hold no malice toward him and show him that I have freely and frankly forgiven him. For if I don't, I may find an unforgiving heart and I will be cast into the hands of the tormentors out of the kingdom and into hell. For the promise of the king is that if I don't get right with my brother, he's not going to forgive me my sins and my trespasses. This is fearful bondage, my dear friend. Don't try to apply it in your life. I want to show you something about this passage. First of all, I want to show you in the first four verses of this chapter, the setting. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is greatest in the church? In the body of Christ? Oh, no, it is the kingdom of heaven. In verse 3, you'll find the teaching is the kingdom of heaven. In verse 4, you'll find the teaching is the kingdom of heaven. And you'll find this in the passage I read between verse 15 and verse 20 that when a brother has trespassed against you under kingdom law, you better get to him as quick as you can and tell him his fault. If he doesn't hear you, take two or three witnesses with you and tell it to him again. 
And if he doesn't hear them, tell it to the church. You say, well, sure, this applies to the church. If you heard the previous messages, you know it has nothing whatever to do with the church, and I'm going to prove it to you again. Jesus says that any two under the kingdom has his authority in their midst. And any two to whom he gave this authority may bind any matter on earth, and it shall be bound in heaven. And he's referring to the judgments against a brother who refuses to hear when somebody goes to him and tells him his fault. And if you turn back to the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, at verse 19, just one chapter back, here's what you hear Jesus saying to Peter, chief of the apostles, And I will give unto thee the keys of what? The kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, listen to me. Did Jesus give the Jewish apostles the authority in his name when two of them were gathered together to bind anything in the kingdom and it would be bound in heaven? And this, he said, pertained to the kingdom of heaven? Certainly he did. And when you come to the 18th chapter, the teaching is not any different. It is still the kingdom of heaven, and he is now telling those to whom he gave this authority how to use it. Here's the way to use it. You may use it in the case of a brother who will not be admonished by another brother, or who will not listen when two witnesses come with that other brother and hear his fault. Bring him before the church, which simply means the assembly of called out ones. It only need be an assembly of how many? Two. For if two of you agree as touching anything, and how many times that verse has been put in a box labeled prayer, and it has nothing whatever to do with prayer. It has to do with the judgments taking place in the kingdom by those who have authority to bind on earth with the authority of the king. We're going to talk about this when we get to prayer. And this is one of the prayer promises that don't work. Oh, you say, don't tell me it doesn't work. Many a time my wife and I have prayed together and God heard and answered. And many a time your wife and you prayed together and he didn't do anything. And you agreed perfectly on what you were praying for, didn't you? And it didn't work. And you said, well, it's my unbelief. But you were agreed. There isn't a thing in this verse about belief. There is a thing in this verse about asking according to the will of God. There is only one thing in this verse that says two of you agree. Just two of you agree. Two of you agree and ask and it shall be done. And I want to tell you I've agreed many times. And I've asked. And I've claimed this promise. And it didn't work. And I'm thankful it didn't. One of the greatest things I have to be thankful for in my life of prayer is that God refuses answer my prayers when I order him to work out my solutions according to my thoughts. One of the greatest fountains of praise in my life this morning is that God has so generally ignored my prayers and went right on praying in me and through me by the Holy Spirit according to his will. Let me tell you something. Don't use this passage on me anymore, my friend. And if you insist on it, be sure you chain the devil before you do. Lease the earth from its bondage and show me the personal presence of the king who's going to keep your flesh and everybody else's in control while I try to carry this out. Don't use this as a billy club on me anymore. It has nothing whatever to do with the age of grace. For instance, if your brother trespass against you, go tell him his fault. Find me one verse in the epistles of grace that repeats this. And I'll retract what I'm teaching this morning. It says in Galatians 6, 1, If a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of meekness. And it doesn't say a thing about going to him and pointing out his faults to him. Not a thing. It talks about bearing his burden. And it talks about restoring him in a spirit of meekness. It doesn't talk about pharisaical judging Let me tell you something else. Read the second Thessalonian epistle in the third chapter. 
in this passage of Scripture, if you really believed it, you would read that if this brother who has been admonished by you personally and then in the presence of two or three witnesses and then before the entire church, which generally you don't carry it out, you may muster up enough courage to go to him privately because you like to point out his faults to him. Gives you a certain air of superiority if you've caught your brother in a fault. We covered this in the messages on Galatians. How many of you ever went back with two or three witnesses? Why? That the law of Moses be established. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word be established. That's Mosaic law, brother. And every jot and tittle of it will be fulfilled in the kingdom. How many of you ever went back to that brother you were so quick to tell his faults to and took two or three spiritual witnesses with you and repeated your charges in their presence? You don't do that, do you? And if you did do it, how many of you came before the church and repeated the same charge you repeated in prayer? You don't do that either because you don't believe the passage except when it works conveniently for you. And if you told it to the church, do you know what the church is supposed to do? If two who have the authority of the king agree that the brother has trespassed, he is to be considered as a heathen and a publican. And a heathen was a dirty Gentile dog in the eyes of the Jew, and the publican was a crooked tax collector. And he was the scum of Jewish society. You tell me that's the teachings of grace, and I'm going to tell you, you don't understand a thing about the Bible. Read Second Thessalonians 3, verses 14 and 15. And you will find out that if a brother walks disorderly, Christians in the age of grace are to mark him, take note of him, have no company with him. Not go to him telling his fault, break off our fellowship with him, that he may be ashamed, but do not treat him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. You'll not find a shred in the epistles of grace that tell Christians to treat another brother in Jesus Christ as a dog and a dirty, crooked politician who's the scum of society. It will be true in the kingdom. And you who like to practice this passage, you don't carry it out because you don't believe it. We like to go to each other and tell each other our faults, and then we like to let it drop there because we don't want to cause trouble. You've caused enough trouble if you've done that. Now, you better carry the passage out, take two witnesses back with you, then stand up before the church and repeat the same charges you repeat in private. And let the church judge. And if they judge that brother has trespassed, then kick him out of the church and tell everybody he's a dirty Gentile dog and no better than a crooked politician and that he's the scum of the earth. Do that, will you? That's kingdom teaching. And that's what this passage says. And that's the reason why it says that if two of you shall agree as touching anything, it will be done. Do you know what that means? It means that if two of these with the authority of the king agree that this brother has trespassed, that as far as heaven is concerned, that man is a dog. And as far as heaven is concerned, that man is an outcast. And as far as heaven is concerned, that man has lost his soul and his portion in the kingdom. Don't tell me anybody got that kind of power. If I did, I'd join up with the Camelites who believe they can vote a man out of the body of Christ with two of their elders. I'm trying to show you, dear people, the legality that's in our lives. The Phariseeism, the bold, blatant Phariseeism that we hide behind and say, we're under grace, you know. Yes, we are. Just as long as legality doesn't give us a guise for our evil. And then we become keepers of the law personified. Well, let me get back to Matthew 5. How's the tape holding now? 20 minutes. Say, that's wonderful. I'd just like to finish this up because I do desperately want to go on tonight.
to the subject we have at hand. Verse 25 and 6, let me just comment briefly. You study this when you go home. Teaches that under the kingdom, a man is to agree with every adversary and every enemy that comes along and do it as quick as he can. Whew. God deliver. God deliver from this phase of the gap. Oh, we don't practice this one. No, it doesn't just fit us just right, does it? It's too hard to wear. Paul, for instance, in Romans 11 says that Israel are our enemies for the gospel's sake. What am I to do then? Go to the Jew and agree with him that Jesus was the bastard son of Mary? For fear that they will cast me to the judge and then to the officer and then into prison? That's what the passage says. Read it. I can't agree with my enemies today. If I agree with my enemies, friendship in the world is enmity with God. But under the kingdom, I am to agree with my adversary just as quickly as I find out he's my adversary. I'm supposed to say, you're right, sir. You're right. I don't want to be taken to the judge. I don't want to be hauled before the officer and cast into prison for having any fight with you. You are right. You are right. Pardon me for contradicting you. Pardon me and forget me. And then we have the teaching in verse 27. You have heard, this is the law, thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus says unto the kingdom, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And for the, the brother who rises up and says to the king, well, I do want to live by kingdom principles, but you know, looking at a woman with lust is just one of my downfalls. And do you know what the king says? Well, we'll take that into consideration. He says, brother, if your eye is causing this, you better pluck it out. Read it. That's the context. If it's your eye that's causing this, far better for you to pluck it out than to have both your eyes and end up in hell. Is your hand a party to the sin of adultery? Some members of your body are party of it? You better cut them off. Far better to cut them off than to have the members of your body and to be cast into hell. Oh, I hope nobody applies this in the age of grace. Well, I'm afraid that most of us, if we applied it, wouldn't have any eyes, nor hands, nor anything else. And the motive, dear brethren, is to keep out of hell. That's the motive. To keep out of hell. Then we go to the subject of divorce. Verse 31, it hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, save for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Listen to me, brethren. Oh, here is another passage that is conveniently used in the lives of professing believers. They conveniently use it because all I have to do is convince myself that my wife is guilty of fornication and I am free to divorce her at any time I want to. Oh, she may be innocent, but that's all right. It says for the cause of fornication, and the Lord has given me the conviction that she's guilty of fornication. I don't care if she ever admits that I'm going to put her away, and all I have to do is tell her that. Jesus said under the law there was one law for divorce. Under the kingdom, there is another law for divorce, and you'll find in searching the scriptures there is a third law for divorce in the age of grace. Want me to give you those three laws? The 24th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, under Moses' law, the first five verses tell simply and plainly that under the law of Moses, because of the hardness of the people's heart, they could divorce their wives if they had no other reason than that they simply didn't like her anymore. For it says that if a man hated his wife, it would be all right to give her a bill of divorcement. In another place when Jesus talked about divorce, some of the Pharisees came back and said, Well, how come then Moses let everybody divorce their wives as often as they wanted to for any reason whatever? Jesus said it was because of the hardness of their hearts. But from the beginning, he said it was never so. For in the beginning they were made one flesh. What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. But in the economy of Sinai, God made an exception, and because of the hardness of Israel's heart, and to keep down fornication, and to keep down adultery while they walked as law keepers, God gave them 
but release of divorce. But he says under the kingdom, no, sir. He says under the kingdom there will be one just cause for divorce, and that will be the cause of fornication. And what does it say in the epistles of grace? I'll tell you what it says. Study 1 Corinthians 7, and you will learn, first of all, that there is no cause for divorce between two believers. None whatever. Do you know why? Because, bless your hearts, we are indwelt of the Spirit of God who is able with a tender heart to make us to forgive even as God hath for Christ's sake forgiven us. There is no cause for divorce between believers. I don't care what my wife has done against me and she should not care what I have done against her. We have the royal law of love which works in us the forgiveness that was worked for us at Calvary. And if grace doesn't work between a man and his wife, where on earth is it going to work? It won't work any place. You can't find, my dear brother, a single place in the Christian epistles where divorce is advocated or approved between two believers. There is one special case given, the special case of a mixed marriage, an unsaved husband and a saved wife, or an unsaved wife and a saved husband. And if one of the parties of that marriage be unsaved, and according to Romans, if it is impossible for that believer to live in peace with that unbeliever, and if that unbeliever choose to depart, if he elect to divorce the believer, the word of God says, let him depart. A brother or sister is under no bondage in such a case. And let me tell you something. I don't know what it is myself, but some of you know, don't you? If you ever lived as a true believer in Jesus Christ with an unbeliever, you know what grace really is when we see that the Lord Jesus has made provision that if we can no longer live in peace and the unbeliever want to depart, he will not hold us in bondage, for truly we are under grace. You see what I'm getting at? Study it carefully. First Corinthians 7, the teaching is as plain as can be. No divorce for two believers. But let two believers <laughs> want a divorce, and oh, let me tell you, they get on kingdom ground real fast, don't they? They say, but it teaches in the book of Matthew. Oh, let me tell you that if fornication isn't involved, they get on mosaic ground real fast. And they go back and say, but it says right there in the book of Deuteronomy, write a bill of divorcement. And that's all you need to do. But let's read the whole Bible. And let's read that between believers there is no cause for divorce in the sight of God. God hath joined them together. No man can put them asunder. But in the case of the believer, whose partner is an unbeliever, who makes it impossible for that believer to live in peace with them, and who insists on a divorce, let that unbeliever go get their divorce. That's what the scripture teaches. But Paul also says that for that believer who has been divorced by an unsaved partner, there is no marriage again until that husband or wife die. And then he says, only in the Lord. And he goes a step further than that and says, you'd be better off to stay single. That's the difference between the law and the kingdom and grace. Then in verse 34 and 5 and 6 and 7, you have the case of swearing. Back in, the, in Moses' law, I don't mean profanity now, I mean taking an oath. Back in the law of Moses, the Jew was forbidden to swear by God, that is to use his name. <coughs> they couldn't take an oath by God under Moses' law. But Jesus said, under the kingdom law, they can neither take an oath by God, they can neither swear by heaven, nor by the earth, nor by Jerusalem. Why? For it is the city of the great what? king. This is kingdom law. You can neither take an oath by Jerusalem, the earth, the heaven, and not even by your own head. Because you can't make one hair white or black. And the oath, he says, doesn't mean a thing, since he, the great king, is in full authority. Let your, let your communication be yes, yes. And no, no. 
Well, if you want to apply this in your life, you go ahead and apply it. But don't you ever say no, sir, because you've added to your communication. It's to be no, no. You try that in the army and somebody slap your mouth for you. Stand up to an officer and say, no, no. <laughs> He'll say, what did you say? I said, no, no. Well, I'll slap your mouth if you don't say no, sir. Well, I can't, sir. It's forbidden in the Bible to say no, sir. You apply this if you want to. Go ahead. You better stay out of the sir. You better even stay out of the presence of somebody polite. Verse 38, I want to read this other passage here. You have heard that it hath been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, listen, that's all out in the kingdom. Resist not evil, whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away your coat, let him have your cloak too. And whosoever will compel you to go a mile, go with him too, and give him that asks of you, and from him that would borrow thee, turn not thou away. How could a man live under those rules in the age of grace? You, it is an impossibility. How could a man do it in the kingdom age? Very simple. If the kingdom conditions were prevailing today, and you walked up to me and slapped me in the cheek, I could turn my other cheek because I know that about the time your hand touches my other cheek, the king and his rod of iron is going to take hold of you. And if you come to me as a child of the kingdom and ask of me, I can give you anything I have because the king is going to provide all my needs and cause me to feast at his table. If you want to borrow from me, I can loan to you because the king will pay me back if you don't, but he'll exact every farthing from you, brother. You see the point? Oh, you say you want to live by these rules, you go ahead and I'll bankrupt you as soon as the meeting's over. Because I'll come up to you and I'll say, give me everything you got. And it says in this passage, if a man says, give it to me, you've got to give it to him. Or else I'll just borrow it from you. I say, loan me everything you have. You wouldn't do it because you'd find out that you didn't rightly divide this passage. You'd say, now wait a minute, that isn't what it means. No, it just wouldn't mean that because it would hurt you then and you wouldn't want to apply the passage. Let me tell you something. The people of Jews and Gentiles who are unsaved, the Jews and the Gentiles in the church are the only kind of people they are in this generation, brother. Those who are under the king rule, if you want to put it this way, are those who are saved. I could loan to a brother in Christ and I could give to a brother in Christ as long as I knew that his request came from the Holy Spirit and not from his flesh. And if a brother in Christ, one whom I knew to be a brother in Christ, in anger slapped my face, I knew I could turn my other cheek and let him slap that one too. For I know he's going to be dealt with by the one who lives in him. But don't tell me that I can go out here in the world and let every unbelieving, God-forsaking, and Christ-despising man who wants to take everything I have from me and put my children in despair and poverty and bankrupt me and send me to the poorhouse, don't tell me I have to open my pockets and give him everything that I have and loan him every dime that I have and let him beat me black and blue in the face and take my coat and my cloak and turn me out naked into this present world. No, that isn't true. He knows no law but Moses' law. It is forbidden in the epistles of grace for a believer to sue another one. But there is not a fragment that forbids me to sue an unsaved man, nor to protect my interest in court if he sues me. And if a man sues me tomorrow and tries to take away my home, what am I going to do? Step out and say, after you, dear sir, it is all yours. I'm going to say to you, my friend, God gave me this home by grace. It was given to me my heaven, by my Heavenly Father, and he has also commanded me to be in subject to the laws of this land. If you have just cause against my home, show it, but show it in court. And then if God takes my home, you're welcome to it, for he will provide me with another. No, you can't apply this passage. Now, there are some of these things that do hold true, for instance. Ye have heard that it hath been said, verse 43, 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And there's certainly nothing there that is forbidden because the same thing is repeated by the Apostle Paul, who was the minister of the doctrines of grace in the book of Romans. I don't have to give up my home to every man that wants it. I don't have to let him beat me black and blue nor take my coat and cloak. I don't have to let him borrow from me or ask of everything that I have and be forced to give it to him, but there is nothing in the laws of grace that prevent me from loving him and praying for him and blessing him. Then the last one is, verse 45, These things are to be done, dear brethren, in order that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. But if I read the epistles of grace right, I read, Ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Not by doing these things. Not by keeping these king, king, kingdom uh, commandments and principles. Not by uh, living under this divine system of order. But by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, we now become the children of God. In verse 48, if you want to get legal, let's put this one on too, will you? Be ye therefore perfect. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's kingdom. Let's don't apply it in the age of grace. It doesn't have anything to do with us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God and for its proper division. We thank you for the Holy Spirit whose job it is to make those divisions and to apply these truths. Show us, Father, the impossibility and show us the wicked sin of taking a verse here and a verse there fracturing them and warping them and remaking them and remodeling them and trying to fit them in to the age of grace because they suit our own selfish and wicked purposes. Oh, deliver us from this. And deliver us from the bondage that comes by such practices, Father. Help us to see what legalists we really are, what Pharisees we really are at times and in certain areas of our lives. We commit this, thy word, to thee, Father that thou wouldst work good in thy glory in all that has been done and said. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Lord bless you.